quarter pounds, wearing green trunks, Benito Gardini. From Argentina, weigh 224 pounds, Antonio the Amazing Rocker. Your referee, Brett Nicholas. You notice that little gesture of Gardini's before, so again we'll have a study of opposites. Gardini said, I use my head, and Rocker uses his bare feet. And here we go. You see that? Rocker constantly moves. Gardini said, hey, what's going on here? Beautifully done. Watch it, you'll see things executed that you've never seen before in your life. Because he can move this boy. There's his stake hold. Looks like he's making chop meat out of Gardini, however. We talked about the power of Joe Stetcher's legs. This boy, besides having power, he has ability to move them. That's Rocker bouncing it up. And a right. Another right by Rocker. There it is. The handstand head scissor by Antonino Rocca. Now he takes himself a nice, beautiful rest. Yeah, we know where your head is. On the ropes, so the hold is broken. Garth Dini thinks he's in there with the atomic bomb. You don't know where it's going to explode. That's a beautiful leg trip by Antonino Rocca. And a toe hold. You can almost hear those bones crack. Nobody can help you now, Gardini. Nobody but yourself. Combination leg, scissor, and toe hold by Rocca. Everything that comes up must go down. So down goes Gardini. Gardini with a cartwheel. A beautiful drop kick by Rocker. Gardini said, this is getting too much for me, Ref, too much. Which way shall I go? Out. See, I used my head, he said. Five, six. Count went up to six. Roll me around again, says Rocker, and over he goes. Leg lock by Rocca. Always presents a moving target, that Rocca. Again, a leg scissor and toe hold combination by Rocca. Gardini feels like the Rocca Gibraltar. He can't move anywhere.
Ride him, cowboy, and down we go. Make him stop jumping up and down, ref. Ref says, get in there and wrestle. Don't bother me. He'll give you a drop kick from any angle, that boy, Rocket. I can do more with my feet than you can do with your hands, says Antonino. See? He uses that leg trip quite a bit. One more time. Attaboy. Now there's one for the book. He can't get his whole shoulders down there to the canvas, but he's got them down there. The human pup tent. Well, anger rears now. If you've ever seen Rocker go berserk, and you know what he'll do. He'll come at him from five different angles all at the same time. That's all, he says. That's enough. You've had your turn. Now look out, brother. Hip roll. Hip roll. A flying mare by Gardini. Right across the Adam's apple to make apple sauce of Rocca. By the hair, a rear chancery, and which way would it go? That away! Right into a beautiful drop kick by Rocca, and again! And again! I would say at this stage of the game, Gardini wants out! And that's where I don't go. Fly, man. He goes up five feet. There's the famous Rocco backbreaker. Gardini will have to give up. Yes, he does. No man can take that one. Benito Gardini conceded that fall, and the winner is the amazing Rocco. The international heavyweight wrestling champion himself, Lou Faz. Welcome to dressing room interviews, Lou. Thank you, Joe. So good to be here again. I believe you're just about the best condition that I've seen you in the last uh, few years. What, what are you doing? What's what? What goes on? Well, I, I keep training, Jules. I think we discussed this before. I'm I'm one of the hungry athletes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I'll, I'll I'll stay hungry because I constantly train, and uh, I very well remember the days when we did a lot of dry run work in the gymnasium. And uh, I've never tired of it, really. Uh, I still do a lot of uh, working out, that is wrestling. Uh, we must wrestle to keep our timing. But uh, aside from that, why well, I do quite a lot of surfing on the beach, and skin diving, uh, kind of a beach bum, too, sometimes. But uh, with the sailing and the whole bit, and uh, I do road work on the beach, uh, Jules. I run <coughs> a mile a day in soft sand with some heavy boots, and that really pulls the cart and keeps you down. Well, thanks a lot, and I hope we'll be seeing more of you. At 229 pounds, international champion, Lou Fez. And his opponent at 225 pounds, Sunland, Vic Christy. Take away, Red Shoe. Well, our ring announcer introduced Vic Christie from Sunland, California. However, I was talking to Vic a little earlier this uh, today, and he told me that he had moved to Woodland Hills, California. Vic, uh, veteran of the mat, always a fine condition wrestler, against Lou Faz, the international heavyweight wrestling champion. Should be a very fine wrestling match. Oh, well, 
Chris Luth has with that left hander has slapping into the side of the head of Christie. Luth, Tyler smiles, referee says, no close fast. One of the wrestlers, though, from time to time, with this fast with that left hand of his, he catches him across the side of the head, and they tell the referee, I'd like to see him close his fast. Open hand a lot of times can hurt a lot more with a slap into the side of the head than a closed fist. And into the wrist lock, slipping into a head scissors, Fez. And on the ring is Fez, tossing Christy Clare across the ring. The referee speaks to Fez. Says, when I ask for a break, I want a good clean break out of both of you. are just about the same size. It's a little hard to distinguish between them, except that Christie's the one with the short crew haircut, or flat top, whichever you prefer to call it. Go behind the trip and the takedown by Christie. Side step over Toho, reversing in on Christie. <laughs> Christie moving into a wrist lock. side of Fez. He must have uh, picked that up when Christie had him through the ropes between the second and the, and the top rope. Quite a large red blue spot. There's Christie moving out under the ropes. Referee asked for a good clean break and gets it. Both these boys are very scientific. They're a little on the They get a little rugged once in a while, but uh, they both depend on wrestling holes and their knowledge of leverage and balance. Christy uses a lot of scissors. In fact, uh, Christy's favorite uh, hole that he uses for defeating his opponents is a flying body scissor. And the same thing with Fez. He uses to a great extent, too. There's a side headlock, Christy. Into the side of the chin by Christy, and Christy looks out across the ring. to the proper point, though, to where he can get the leverage on Christie's leg. I think Christie's moving it out. That's right, Christie maneuvered the foot out from the leg. It's interesting to watch a match like this. Uh, you watch the little things that way because you see how these boys that are on the scientific side of wrestling, how they maneuver the hole just the least bit, changes the whole leverage and balance on the hole. Out 
under the apron. Both boys under the apron. He's a tireless wrestler. Keeps on the go all the time. As with a hammer lock, and it's good for the fall as Christy submits to the fall. Let's get our ring announcer, Ray Meadow, in and see what the time of the fall was. And both boys moving in. Introducing from Los Angeles, California, weighing 245 pounds, Mike Valentino. His opponent from Paris, France, weighing 230 pounds, the heavyweight champion of the world, Edouard Carpentier. The referee, Eddie Creechman. The great applause, of course, was for the recognized heavyweight champion of the world, Edward Capuccio. And his displays, of course, have thrilled fans for many years all around this world. Mike Bella Valentino from Los Angeles. Big fellow, rangy type. And, uh, oh, and a pin by Valentino to punch the punch here, fails. And they lock again in the referee hole with the big fellow forcing the issue. And uh, there goes the deal. He didn't get the punch here very far. of disdain, right across the face of Valentino. This fellow Carpentier has defeated the greats in wrestling. I refer, of course, to Killer Kowalski, to Buddy Rogers, and their like. Kowalski, incidentally, is now on a tour of Japan, and Carpentier ever insists that it was he that chased him out of the country. Capuntia tying up Valent uh, Valentino, and it's very hard to describe a whole such a move. It is such, uh, such an unorthodox one. Valentino stepping to be between the ropes to get away from uh, Capuntia. And Valentino starting to hammer his man, but the front face lock, but his skin is broken up as it was a choke. Placed by Capontier. Edward Capontier has a has quite a variety of holes. And uh, Valentino, no doubt, will feel the full effect of these before he's finished. Capontier getting the head to the midriff of Valentino. Although he hails from uh, Los Angeles, uh, now uh, Valentino originally uh, came from the island of Malta in the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, uh, that little island there was one of the, uh, was probably the most heavily bombed area of land. Of, uh, during the Second World War. Capontier down on his shoulders, rolling off. And I must apologize to my French friend uh, for my uh, pronunciation. 
if it is not correct. Oh, the count went to two on Valentino, and he must have got a finger to the eye of Capuncia. Capuncia distressed after that eye gouging, and a nasty one it was as Valentino taking, taking advantage of the situation. Capuncia is a anger comes back at him, and the forearm job coming up heavy under the chin. Valentino appealing now for Capuncia to stand back. He's a big rangy fellow, Valentino, and there's watching all of the time. He has met some of the, the best in uh, the wrestling profession. And again, the great Edward Capuncia, he is against the best. Here's the referee going in for the count. We'll play that official move fast. Valentino backing into the corner. If ever you have the opportunity in your uh, local arena to watch the great uh, Capuncia in action, I do it by you to take advantage of it. Because he's a great, uh, great performer. And Valentino now hammering away at him in the corner is ordered back by the official. The referee becoming a little impatient with Valentino, and there could be a disqualification if he does not watch out. Five uh, minutes. playmate for the evening is Magnificent Maurice. Even before the action gets underway, the fans show their disapproval of the Magnificent One. Maurice tries to be a good sport about it by shaking hands before the match, but he follows this gesture by clouding Bruno on top of his head, and the fight is on. for mercy from his corner.
Now the two Goliaths engage in a bit of stand-up Indian wrestling. Maurice gets the edge by pulling Bruno to earth by his locks. The referee scolds Maurice for his action, but the fans love it. Bruno may be in a bad way if he hasn't a large bottle of aspirin for after the fight. Early Bruno retaliates by bouncing back, then he goes to work on Maurice's fair skin. Maurice is back in form after a brief setback. Bruno then puts his 264 pounds to work by bouncing Maurice once again. Then he skips into the crowd to be with his fans. This lady has a few words of encouragement for Bruno, and he decides he'd be safer in the ring. Bruno climbs back with blood in his eyes, and this spells trouble for Maurice. Bruno tries to embrace his companion. The loving bear hug is so effective that it squeezes the breath from Maurice. And that's all for the evening. Maurice will be the first to tell you the Italian Superman is here to stay. Welcome to the horror show. Look at that. I've seen better heads on cabbages, haven't you? There he is, hero of uh, the Mau Mau tribe, Carl Von Hess. Killer Carl Von Hess. Who just got his little head slapped by Ricky Starr. And if you're the type who likes fireworks, well, we're going to shoot off several rockets right here, believe me. Ricky Starr versus Carl Von Hess. The next event, ladies and gentlemen, one fall to a finish, a one-hour time limit. Introducing at this time the referee for this bout, referee Fandor Kovac. Thank you. At this time... <laughs> At this time, ladies and gentlemen, Greenwich Village, 201 pounds, the sensational of wrestling today, ladies and gentlemen, a warm reception for Ricky Starr. His opponent from Germany, 220 pounds, Carl von Hess. to the most important part of this match. Ricky Starr will toss one of his little ballet slippers, I hope, in this direction, because Harvey Jerome would like to have it. See there? Looks like I'm going to wind up marrying Ricky Starr because I caught the wreath. Kovacs uh, frisking what's left of Ricky Starr. Ricky's letting his hair grow out on his chest. Watch this now. Uh, Mr. Von Hess will now submit to... Uh, this will be a wild one. They're off now. First, Ricky has to get loose, of course, with a few demi-plies, 
and whatnot. Very pretty, isn't it? Welcome to the Sadler Wells Ballet. The Sandy Sadler Billy Wells Ballet. Sandy Sadler Orson Wells Ballet. Watch this. Huh? That's a lovely pair of trunks that Ricky almost has on, aren't they? I think Von Hess just gets uglier and meaner. Me, I just get uglier. shoes tonight, and Von Hess wearing a snarl. I think Von Hess is going to kind of scout Ricky out of the ring. Right on, Star. Just loosening up. Nothing wrong with that. Wish you would loosen up out of camera, though. This is a family network, you know. Funny how some athletes uh, use one form of calisthenics and others use another, isn't it? And some of them are like Ricky Starr. to be buddy-buddy. The star answers him in sign language, which means dash, dash, dash. by Bumps and Grinds Incorporated. Most of the gyrations that Ricky used were taught him by Toots Mont, an old burlesque star. You remember Toots. He was the best man for Dame May Whitty, May Bush, Abner Doubleday, and Pocahontas. Well, we don't get much wrestling. Uh-oh. I don't think that Ricky meant to hit Mr. Von Hess that hard. We don't get much wrestling down here, but we do have a lot of fun, don't we? See, Star's a good wrestler when he wants to be, when he cuts out the clowning. But who wants him to cut out the clowning? Uh, 
apparently not uh, didn't have his dinner. Got a little. Uh, they're not whispering. Von Hess is just biting Ricky's ear. Ricky will have to wrestle with only one ear. Terrible disadvantage. just came in here, just arrived from Tokyo with Lou Fez. Phil, say a few words in Japanese for us, will you? Oh, Phil prefers not to speak. a little fighting. Ricky reminds me a lot of those wrestling midgets, doesn't he? Except those midgets are a little taller. Ricky's hair is set by Eddie Taylor, who also is our timer here. Bob Free does his nails. Von Hess's hair is set by the Washington Concrete Company. He's a hard-headed chap. just like the midgets do it. Oh, Ricky missed then. Not then. Star's on the way now. Well, I didn't see any count, did you? We got something going with Kovacs and Von Hess. Hess complains he got a quick count. get us off the air. The one guy we do trust, though, is our old pal, Bob Freed. The winner, the sensational Ricky Stark. Well, this thing ain't getting over yet. And it, watch this. that the winner of this match, as if you didn't know, the winner of this match between Ricky Starr and Carl Von Hess was a Ricky Starr. 
Well, this is Vern Gagne, a former great University of Minnesota football player against Butcher Boy Henny, who comes from Iowa. Watch him go to work on this hand of Gagne's now. You're in a good position here. He's going after the rope to cut off the circulation. He's got it underneath his hand. Loose goes is in there looking now. But he's got the string covered up with his hand. There it is. The handing, cover, handing covers it up, but now he gets back and slips it inside his trunks. Actually, it's just a string from his trunks. like swapping a BB gun for uh, an atomizer. Gagne really teed off on him that time. There's a hip roll by Gagne. Headlocked by Henning. <laughs> Henning says, no, oh, I always say. Look out. Leg trip, but Henning didn't want to come. Henning didn't want to go on that one. Gagne rolling the boat down the stream now. Tremendous amount of pressure on Henning's leg. And Henning is doing a crawl right for the ropes. He's getting closer. Gagne's device now. Oh, it's a version of the Boston Crab. It's a finishing hole. This could be it. Depends on how much Henning can take here. Oh, that hurts. Henning is still saying no, though. Look at that, he's inching toward the ropes despite all the pain and pressure. Now, I don't know how you feel about Lee Henning, but we've got to give him credit for a lot of courage. There's a fellow who's taken a lot of pain. And it's easy to give up in there, you know. It's easy to say, I've had enough, but he's not doing it. trying to get hold of Gagne's hair there, but Byrne has it cut rather short. He did get hold of an ear, that's regulation size. You hear that? He said, why, why, why? He's trying to pull my leg off, isn't he? And he was, gotta say that. Byrne was trying to get it off. Now he beat him over the head with it. in control. He's got an arm lock there. Using that right leg of his to do it.
Gagne continues to work on the underpinning of Lee Henning. Look at Lee right on his head this time, and he's got there. Some, a fan was hollering at Gagne and telling him what to do, and Henning suddenly hollered, shut up. He's the little man that wasn't there that time. Gagne was there that time. Taking those nails into the eyes of Gagne underneath. Doing it again. Now he's really splatting them. You can hear those socking in there. There goes Gagne out of the ring. back in there, watch him. Oh, he hit Luz Goza. Now he gets Henning. Shoulder blocks he's throwing. There's another one. Count Lou. Gagne coming up out of the ring, and he's bad about this whole situation. Oh, he's twisting and turning, and he's got Lee Henning going. There's a sleeper. He's putting a sleeper hold on him. Got the sleeper hold on him. And there goes Lee Henning off into the land of dreams. Lee won't get out or get up. Gagne is telling Scoza he can count to 150. Maybe that's a little high, but Henning will not be able to rise for a few moments. Gagne, aroused by being kicked and thrown out of the ring, came back like a tiger to finish off Lee Henning in quick order. Vern Gagne, the winner. From Russia, weighing 242 pounds, wearing black trunks, Kola Guariani. From Chicago's north side, known as Mr. America, weigh 222 pounds, wearing black trunks, Gene Stanley. Your referee, Fred Nicholas. Well, once again, we're all set. I don't have to tell you which one is Gene Stanley. He's got hair. And man, what hair he's got. So it's Gene Stanley now on the right, Cola Quariani on the left. The Gene is a real showman. Quariani breaks nice and clearly, which naturally surprises everybody. Japanese arm like in there by Stanley, and a monkey flip by Gene. Don't you love the way Gene just prances around that ring? Be a chance by Gene Stanley. And a hip roll by Stanley. Gene 
really applying that pressure at this point. It was apparently applying more than pressure because the referee had to break the hold. Probably got a thumb in the eye there. We couldn't see it from our angle. Has a waist lock on the ropes. Stanley breaks cleanly and one for good measure, a leg trip. Stalks away confidently, smiling at those females down yonder. You wonder why sometimes he doesn't really aggravate the wrestler, but aggravating the wrestler or not, he pleases the ladies. Hair pull that time by Cole Aquariani, which puts Gene at a decided disadvantage. There's a headlock and a counter move, a head scissor by Mr. America. Man, it looks like a crystal ball from this angle. Now you'll notice that this is a rest hold for Gene Stanley. All he does is apply a little bit of pressure and now gets the pleasure of pride to him. Not for long. There's a beautiful flying mare by Stanley. Watch for this flying tackle by Stanley. Gene going berserk. boy can do to a crowd. Front chancer in a back body drop. Go to Quadiani, the bus now. Which quiets the spectators down a little bit. Gene Stanley coming from the north side of Chicago has a big following here. Headlock by Gene Stanley. She likes it. A beautiful waist lock. He's getting set now for the spread eagle. So he takes a leg split instead. Quariani just tearing those legs apart. A look of complete frustration on the face of Gene Stanley. Now he's, he's got to figure himself way out, and there it is. The Indian Deathlock is a counter move. Incidentally, that Indian Deathlock is also a counter move, the spread eagle or the cradle. Takes is a little gesture like that to send the crowd wild. Okay. Okay. And they're under the ropes. Referee breaks the hole, Gene breaks almost cleanly and stalks away. It's Cola Quadiani with his back to us. Gene Stanley in the corner, about to spring. Oh, no, you don't.
has a beautiful cartwheel by Coriani. Gene says, all right, if that's the way you want to play, we'll play. All right. Fly mare by Stanley. And a beautiful double knee smash by Stanley. Headlock, back hole, and a body slam by Stanley. This is the way to wear a man down. There it is again. Well, three for good measure. Ooh, and a body press by Gene. This could be it. Yes, yes, yes. And Stanley does it again. He's going to help him up. Halfway. A body press. The winner, Sta Gene Stanley. So wrestling fans head for the arena where they're treated to a championship match between the challenger Bobo Brazil and his worthy opponent, handsome Johnny Barron, the current champion. While Brazil awaits the grand entrance of Barron, he signs some autographs for his many fans. And here comes handsome Johnny with his faithful valet leading the way. Barron looks like one of the characters you might see in a Charlton Heston movie as he parades around the ring with his cloak and yum-yum stick. It doesn't take long to establish who's who in a wrestling match, but just for the record, the champ is the bad guy, and the challenger is the sentimental favorite. Before the match even gets started, Handsome Johnny tries to attack Brazil with his candy cane, or whatever that thing is. But Bobo takes it away from him and retaliates. Just say, abracadabra, Bobo, and they'll both disappear. Once it's been decided as to the participants in this brawl, Brazil goes to work on Johnny Barron. But the eighth wonder of the world decides he'd better take a powder fast before Brazil rides him into space. Bobo was the former champ until he lost his heavyweight title to Barron in Cleveland. Now, with a good chance to get it back, Brazil is making an all-out effort to permanently rid himself of handsome Johnny as he chases him right out of the ring. Here comes Diamond Jack with some words of advice to aid Barron in his darkest hour. That Jack fella is just bubbling over with wisdom and Baron responds immediately. Brazil is down and Johnny is up, but not for long. Bobo doesn't hang around to find out what it's like to get a knee in the bread basket. Baron can hardly stand it as he looks for a little sympathy in act one of a classic performance. They reverse head holds, then Baron rides into a real haymaker that almost puts his lights out. Diamond Jack says some magic words to his boy. Then Handsome Johnny recovers enough for a winding windup. Using Baron for a football, Brazil boots him all over the place, but the tide changes all of a sudden. Baron gets out of a head scissors by dumping Brazil off the ring apron and into the seats. The fans yell for Bobo to get back into the ring before he's disqualified. Unfortunately, Brazil doesn't make it, and handsome Johnny Barron successfully defends his title in Summer Stock's top attraction of the wrestling world. Sam Steamboat, come on in, Sam. Come around here, let us get a good look at this uh, athlete. Sam is the heavyweight wrestling champion of Hawaii, and he is also he also hosts some other championships. Tell us about it, Sam. Well, uh, I went home in December and we defended our canoe championship. Uh, we hold a world's record for paddling uh, eight hours continuously from one island to another. 
This is the outrigger. This is the outrigger canoe racing. And they hold those each year, don't they? Uh, we hold that uh, once a year, the island to island, but we have a race that comes every week. Every Sunday we have a race. And uh, you say uh, eight hours. Now, you, you paddle continuously for eight continuously hours? Continuously for eight hours. About how much uh, uh, distance will you cover? Uh, we would cover somewhere between 60 to 65, 65 miles. Oh, man, that's not... I'm an Indian, but I never did paddle that far, you know. At 225 pounds from Hawaii, Sam Steamboat. His opponent at 260 pounds, Canada, Big Mike Sharp. Take it away, Dugan. Red Shoes Dugan, the referee tonight. Red Shoes, quite a wrestler himself, a light heavyweight wrestler. Wrestled uh, all over the country, in Canada and Mexico. And now he's a referee, and a very fine referee, too. He does a real good job. Now it's Sam Steamboat the Hawaiian wrestling champion, meeting Big Mike Shark. <laughs> Sam Steamboat, a boy that uh, Lou Fez discovered while he was in Honolulu. He was an amateur wrestler there. Lou discovered him, took him under his way. A real top notch wrestler of this boy. Real powerhouse. Hey, watch him go. It's sharp. There's a sharp down on the mat. Incidentally, this boy, Sam Steamboat, is left handed, as you probably already noticed, the same as the fellow that trained him, Lou Fair. So, when you see a lot of moves that you think look familiar to you, they're probably those that you've seen Lou Fair make. Lou Fez, you know, is the international heavyweight wrestling champion and one of the truly great wrestlers of our time. I think you're seeing a boy right now that's just going to be tops. Yes, sir. Young fella, tremendous all-around athlete, holds the outrigging championship of the island. And a boot for the midsection by Sharp. He's going down on the floor. Red Shoes Dugan head close. Watches the hold. Says it isn't a choke, though. Young Sam there, too. 
You're going to see a lot more of him in the last thing then because this boy's a real comer. He's going to get the tough man tonight. One of the top contenders for the championship. Oh, 
continues to hold the cross body scissor on Steamboat. Steamboat trying to maneuver back to his feet, manages to turn Sharp over, get him a little off balance, but Sharp still holding those legs around the midsection. Trying to tell the referee that Steamboat was choking him. However, the hands were not down to the throat. And Steamboat does make his way to the
14 minutes are gone so far. And a steamboat up on the second row, pounding into the side of the head of Five men are top fighting for us. of the evening pits the great Scott and wrestling's biggest drawing card, Argentina Rocca, against the Von Hess brothers, Carl and Eric, in a tag team match. Carl Von Hess in the black trunks is receiving some outside help from brother Eric in his battle with the great Scott. The Scott shows what he thinks of the help. Carl finds himself in a vice-like hold by the great Scott, who gets some help from teammate Argentina Rocca. Rocca is chased from the ring by referee Benson, but he offers advice from the apron. Once again, Rocca rushes to the aid of his partner, who's having trouble in the Von Hess corner. Referee Joe Benson has to order Rocca from the ring, and Rocca isn't happy with the request. The great Scott shows he can take care of himself, and has Carl Von Hess begging for mercy. Referee Benson becomes involved in an argument with the great Scott, and Benson does a gorilla act to settle the argument. Rocca shows the flying drop kick that has made him famous and given him a reported earning power of $150,000 a year. He completely outclasses Eric Von Hess with his acrobatic antics. Antonio Rocca, the agile Argentine, and the great Scott out to the Von Hess brothers to win the match and send action-hungry fans home with a full evening of fun under their belts. <laughs> 